for reactions in aqueous solution. Why this study now? Chapter one and two was refreshing us on some foundational things we learned in first year chemistry. Chapter three was to refresh us really on the mathematics involved with really being able to come up with evidence for what is going on in a chemical reaction. So why now reactions in aqueous solution? All right, aqueous, that of course means dissolved in water. Water is the solvent in the background. The majority of reactions in our world happen in an environment of water. The reactions in our body, the reactions in most of the solutions we interact with in lab have water in the background. So once we have, you know, refreshed on some fundamentals and then reminded ourselves, how do we apply some measurement values and then mathematically kind of interpret those? Well, now we're getting nice and deep into understanding the chemistry of what is going on. This is a phenomenal chapter, absolutely phenomenal. You really will enjoy it. All right, water. Water is so wonderfully unique. We will talk so much about water. So if we remember, the oxygen atom has six valence electrons, hydrogen each has one. So the Lewis dot structure for the bonding has each oxygen sharing one electron with the one electron from hydrogen making a single bond with each of our hydrogens. So on our oxygen, we have two unshared electron pairs and two shared pairs. So to distribute these four pairs of electrons as equally as possible to minimize the repulsion these are gonna um, kind of exert on each other, they are going to separate themselves in what we would call an electron geometry of tetrahedral. However, we do not see electrons. We just see bonded atoms. And so we often draw the water molecule as a Mickey Mouse head. So we'll see this again and again and again. But what we have to remember is we have those two lone pairs. So this is a, a nice, um, you know, better uh, 3D model, if you will, than, than my drawing. But the Mickey Mouse ears are hydrogens, but we still have those lone pairs along kind of the chin area. Well, oxygen, remember, is more electronegative, so it has a greater pull because of the number of protons, but also the proximity of where those electrons are to the nuclei of oxygen. Don't worry, we will get near and dear to this to come. But we also have these lone pairs of electrons. That's gonna make this side of the molecule much more negative. Now it's just a partial negative. It is not a full ion. So it's not that the electron has been transferred and is permanently remaining here. It's just a partial charge. And we use that, looks like an adapted music note. So by default, this is, will be a little less electron rich or low in electron density. So in our water molecule, we have one side that's a little more positive and one side that's a little more negative. And we use those partial charges. So the water molecule is like a magnet. Now, when water molecules align, they're gonna align, so a positive, or the ears, are gonna be near the negative, and then a negative is gonna be near a positive, and so on and so on and so on, and they're gonna keep alternating. So we wanna have a good visualization of how water molecules are in the, the liquid state. Probably this is showing a little more um, spatial distance between molecules, but this is a good idea of kind of the clustering that we would have. Now in the student note packet, there's an excellent, excellent um, kind of molecular animation that you can do. Just take a couple minutes and it's really nice because it will just give you a good um, molecular level kind of image of how water molecules associate when they align. All right, 
water is a polar molecule in that one side is, is a little more negative. There's two poles, partial negative, partial positive. And so that, that causes some attraction between other water molecules, but also between other substances that might come into contact with water molecules. All right, aqueous solution. So to remind us, a solution is a homogeneous mixture. Two or more samples of matter that are consistently distributed throughout the entire sample. We say what is dissolved is the solute. We can often also diagnose the solute because it's in the lower quantity. What does the dissolving is the solvent. Most times it will be water, not always. For now, we're going to make um, the assumption that water is our solvent unless otherwise told. If something is soluble, that means it has a complementary particle attraction to the solvent. Remember, there's um, a guiding principle, like dissolves like. So we can substitute in polar or nonpolar. Polar will dissolve polar, nonpolar will dissolve nonpolar. So water will dissolve sodium chloride because water is polar and sodium chloride being, ion being ionic, that is the most extreme of what can be polar. Water dissolves sucrose, sucrose is polar. Um, let's see, gasoline dissolves canola oil. Both are nonpolar. So they have to have complementary particle attraction and that will go in line with, are they both polar? Are they both nonpolar? The degree of saturation or how much can be dissolved will be decided by the amount of particle attraction that can form between the solute and the solvent or how much energy has to be invested in overcoming the particle attraction within the solute itself or within the solvent itself. So that gets to, okay, how do we go from separate solute, for example, sodium chloride, and separate solvent, for example, water, to sodium chloride, and we would place an aqueous on there, meaning that in our beaker of salt water, we have solute equally distributed amongst the solvent. So how do we go from these separate ingredients to this one product? We say that a solution forms, remember, in general, generally three steps, so in our humanness. Now these probably happen simultaneously, but we usually put them in this order, and really one and two can, can be interchanged. But we say first, and for what has to happen before we get here is the solute-solute attraction has to be broken. And so we will get definitely more in tune with being able to diagnose, okay, sodium chloride, this is coming, is an ionic solid. We already know that because it's made of metal and nonmetal. What is holding it is ionic bonding. It's electrostatic attraction between a full sodium ion and a full chloride ion. Okay, we're gonna talk about lattice energy and some other things with ionic compounds. Well, that is a very strong force. We're gonna apply Coulomb's law and oh, so much to come. But there's particle attraction holding these ions together. Well, that attraction has to be broken. Otherwise, how is water gonna do its thing on these ions? Well, we know water molecules are attracted to each other. So we need to break that. So the solvent-solvent attraction. And in the case of water, it's hydrogen bonds, intermolecular force of hydrogen bonds. All right, but then if a solution is forming, it's because the solute and the solvent attraction has formed. All right, well, how, how do we even know this? How do we, how do we get here? Well, it's from observations. So, 
can we transition to the concept of an electrolyte. An electrolyte is a substance that can sustain an electric current. Now, a conductor. Now, we'll have to be forgiving because a lot of chemists use, use conductivity and sustaining an electric current synonymously, but we'll be forgiving. An electrolyte sustains an electric current. It runs out. It stops eventually, like a battery. Where a conductor, a metal, it has free-moving electrons. And so, in essence, in theory, a metal can con conducting because there's a sea of electrons forever, in theory, in theory. So to be a conductor of electricity, you need to have free-moving electrons. And we will remind ourselves that with metallic substances, that's what is responsible for their bonding. All right. Electrolytes sustain an electric current. All right. So you know that while you're taking a bath, you should not blow dry your hair at the same time. Because while that um, blow dryer is plugged into the wall, if it would fall into the water, your bath water is an electrolyte. It sustains an electric current. Okay. If we had an electrolyte and we placed a light bulb inside of it. Now, a light bulb in and of itself cannot light unless we plug it in. So, if we had an outlet that could give electrons, and if we could send electrons through one side of the light bulb and those electrons would travel through the filament, creating friction, then that friction would energize and, and promote electrons and would create light. Well, electrons only will flow if there's a constant path. If you have a break in the circuit, they don't flow. Well, if we had a wire up to this light bulb, I'm not a good artist, this light bulb would not light because the electrons would go here and there's nothing continuing to pull them. We need, if we would put a piece of metal across there, well, that would complete the circuit. And then there would be a full path for them to follow. All right. Well, if we would put this light bulb into pure water, no go. There's no lighting of the light bulb. However, if it's sodium chloride, the light bulb lights. However, if we do that with sucrose, C12H22O11 dissolved, guess what? Light bulb does not light. So it's from observations like this that we get our idea of electrolytes. Okay, we talked about this in honors chemistry. So, what is an electrolyte? And if it's not an electrolyte, we call it a non-electrolyte. And what enables it to do that? And what is the difference between dissociation and ionization? So that will be the remainder of what we're gonna talk about. Okay, so if you remember, what we understand from observations like this, is that ionic compounds that are soluble, soluble ionic compounds, what we understand is they dissociate in a solvent that they're soluble in. Now, ionic are oppositely charged ions. They're the most extreme of polar. It's kind of an insult to say, oh, an ionic compound is polar, that's kind of redundant, saying, you know, chemistry is beautiful. Well, of course. So they, of course, are going to be soluble in the polar water. All right. Dissociation is simply the breaking up of the ions that are present in the ionic compound. It is a physical change, a physical change. 
So for example, sodium chloride. We all know that is soluble in water. Well, for every one sodium chloride, I get one sodium ion and one chloride ion. Now, it would be best if I put the phase symbol of aqueous. That is dissociation. What about magnesium bromide? Soluble ionic, that gives us magnesium, alkaline earth metal, so it's a positive two ion. And the ratio, I need two bromides, and bromine being a halogen, it of course will be a negative one charge. Now, one positive two and two negative ones, that gives me my neutral compound um, in the reverse. All right, this is dissociation. So, what we understand is this is what is happening and it is ions that are present that are enabling the electric current to be sustained. So, soluble ionic compounds through dissociating are what create an electrolyte. So an electrolyte has free moving ions, free moving ions. So, sucrose, now we know, is soluble. So, wh what is happening? Well, from what we understand, covalent do not dissociate. So, covalent solutes, no dissociation. What we understand is they are just broken up into individual molecules. So you take your cluster of molecules that are being held by um, hydrogen bonds here, but then they are individually broken up and then surrounded by water molecules. All right, so if we were to accurately show sodium chloride aqueous. Well, we would have to equally distribute the sodium ions and the chloride ions. Now what I should do is respect, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So for every one sodium ion, I need to draw a chloride ion if all that I've done is taken the sodium chloride and placed it into water. Now, this is being held in solution by water molecules. But the way that the water will be associated is it's gonna be the neck side, the chin side, rather, of, of the Mickey Mouse. Because remember, that's the oxygen, that's gonna be the partially negative, the ears are the partially positive. Where on the chloride, well, that's gonna be the ears. Now, it's a general rule of thumb that usually there's at least three solvent for every solute. It's just kind of a, a commonplace thing that we've come up with. Now, usually, honestly, there's many more that are working to suspend and then equally distribute. Okay, so then what's the deal with sucrose? Well, I wouldn't expect you to be able to draw that kind of Lewis dot. But what we understand is, you know, the sucrose, well, there's going to be sides that are positive and negative, and so I'm just going to go ahead and say that this side would be probably the, the more um, negative, and then here's maybe the more positive, and, and so on. So, it, but the, the difference is, I, I wouldn't label this as a full positive or full negative, but I would try to, you know, equally distribute these, you know roughly. No, no one's going to, um, you know, pick out a, a ruler and make sure that you've measured all of this, but w we get the idea. Yeah? Okay. So, dissociation, not dissociation. Okay. Electrolyte, non-electrolyte. Okay. So, that gets us started with the idea of, um, you know, why is water so wonderful and, um, some 
remind you of some terms, steps of solution, and just a basic um, introduction to this idea of electrolytes. The next will actually involve um, more about, okay, so if we are given a formula, how, how do we categorize it with confidence?